my name's Ruth Jones, um, and I chair the big board of directors under our newly reformed governance structure. Um, and I've stepped in because poor Karina's sick with COVID, and I know there's been a lot of it about. Um, so poor Karina has sent me her speech. I'm going to try and follow it um, and keep us to order as best I can. Um, so for any of you that don't already know, BIC the UK industry's dedicated supply chain organisation. And our aim is to make the book supply chain more efficient, sustainable by developing standards and encouraging their adoption. We define the best practice, we connect experts and stakeholders to enable measurable in innovation. And you can find more out about BIC um, on the screen, and there are a bunch of QR codes at the back. They're all different. Joe's just told me that. Um, um, so you can find out much more. We're trying to be much more sustainable, not print too much. But there are also seminar programs, a few of them here, also with the QR codes. Can you see the theme? Um, really great to see so many people here in person. Um, I noticed that uh, the front page, soaring costs and supply chain issues right at the front. Uh, we couldn't be more apt if we tried. Um, every year we put together and host this seminar, and all the presentations today are going to give you helpful advice. Well, most of them, mine probably won't, but everyone else's will, um, and give you information on what you can do to build a more efficient, sustainable business. And starting, um, we're going to start with an overview of the post-pandemic trends, sorry, supply chain responses, and some lessons in terms of what we can um, learn uh, as we emerge. Do we emerge? Are we emerging from the pandemic? I'm not sure we are, but we emerge into something else. Um, we're going to hear also about the impact of the pandemic um, in terms of book market performance and buying patterns and trends. And then we're going to go on and look at the international efforts to ad address climate change, um, particularly around sustainability being a strategic priority for BIC. Then we're going to um, find out some more about BIC's Green Supply Chain Committee, uh, the Green Supply Chain Work Plan, and associated projects. And we'll have an update from the Green Book Alliance. Keeping efficiency and sustainability to the fore, we're going to learn a little bit more about the BIC projects to agree, document and promote ordering best practice in the physical book supply chain, um, really to encourage responsible consumption and production through sustainable practices. And then we're going to move on to learning more about industry metadata standards, what they already do and, support, and how they support a progressive industry. I'm going to miss this one. Um, there's going to be some, some slots for questions, but it's not going to be after every session. I'm going to endeavour to keep us to order, but it's a bit difficult when you're the speaker at the same time, so please bear with me. Um, and then, just so that we can have a sense of the balance of people in the room, um, can I have a show of hands? So, have we got some authors? No, they just don't care about the supply chain. That's good. Uh, retailers? Great. Wholesalers? Should I put my hand up? So, okay. uh, publishers, uh, tech service providers, that's me as well, um, aggregators, printers, put my hand up, uh, libraries, yay, BL in the corner, uh, what have we missed? Students, anything else? No, great, okay, so we've got a good balance here. Um, so we're going to start off with um, my talk. So anyway, I'll introduce myself. So I'm Ruth Jones, um, and I'm also uh, Director of, of Global Sales for the Digital uh, Products Division of Ingram. Ingram is a very, very large wholesaler. We're involved in all aspects of the supply chain, um, and, uh, but my focus is primarily e-books and audiobook distribution. But I dabble. I think that's probably what I'd say. So let's hope this works. Da -da -da. When I was preparing this talk, I really struggled with trying to pull some slides together that weren't so what, and I absolutely failed. Because the supply chain has become the center of our everyday life. Most normal people outside the book industry hadn't thought about the supply chain at all before the pandemic. Nobody thought about it. Nobody thought about how they bought things. People complained a bit about Amazon, but not so much because they deliver lots of stuff to your doorstep. A lot has changed in the last two years. And what I wanted to do then was, to, uh, when I thought about how to focus my thoughts, because you could ramble forever, um, I took four pillars, and I, I plagiarized this. So first off, I have, not the bullets underneath, but I have plagiarized the, the, the core tenets. And I took them um, from ISO, 
and their strategic document, because actually it really was an excellent strategic document, um, and it really gave me a framework here. So I'm going to look at, at four aspects. So the first aspect is really looking at what happened in terms of the changing expectations and behavior. And Andrew's going to talk a lot more about consumer behavior. But there's been a huge shift to online ordering. We've all seen that, and the expectations that come with that. Uh, credit Klarna, Klarna being, you know, you can pay in payments. I don't know how many people do online shopping and do that. You have Klarna, now PayPal does it. There's a whole load of a quasi-credit industry rising. I got something from Monzo the other day as well. There's been a huge shift. Before the pandemic, less than 50% of the, of the British population said that they preferred online shopping. Earlier this year, when they did, ran this uh, report, 70% now prefer online shopping. That's not to say people don't like physical shopping, but that huge shift puts a big pressure onto the supply chain for the book industry that previously had not really put the consumer at the center of things. Amazon, in 2021, up 22% which I think is actually a pretty poor show, given everything that was going on. Um, but that's their business. They're up to $469.8 billion. Um, but the consumers are more discerning as well. Not only do they want the supply chain to work well for them, over 50% of them are now looking for suppliers with sustainable credentials. So that shift, those things coming together, are really starting to put pressures on all of the supply chains. And that is something that we need to respond to as a book industry. That is something we need to understand. At the same time, there are new, enormous shifts in the way that people are expecting to work and then expecting to consume content. So it's not an either or anymore. The rise of audio, I'll talk about that in a minute, in a minute as well. The rise of audio is well documented, but actually that's from a very small base. Ebooks through the pandemic became incredibly useful. Um, for people with online learning, audio went through the roof after a little lull uh, when people stopped con uh, commuting. I guess everyone was on their hourly walk, desperately trying to listen to something else that wasn't the news. But that huge shift is something that we need to, to be mindful of as, as we, we start to come out and say, what does this look like? I'm not even going to say the new normal because I don't think normal and, and how we expect to do business when I started in publishing is re even relevant we have to be agile, we have to be responsive, and we have to invest in systems that enable people to buy whenever and whatever they want with, and to have that content delivered to them when they need it. The challenge is there are a few barriers to that. So the next is the environment. I'm not going to go on about the environment. This is not my specialist subject. There's no one in this room that's going to say this is not important although possibly the London Book Fair organisers looking to the back, so we don't have a water refilling there, um, and we don't seem to have recycling bins. Am I the only one that noticed that here? Um, not a happy bunny. Anyway, I digress. Supply chain efficiencies is what BIC has been about from its very inception. But that was always something that perhaps the, the nerdy people in the corner of the publishing house paid attention to, and it was just a big, bit of a pain if things were stuck in returns and there was an argument with a bookseller. Now, we have to pay attention. We can't be shipping books left, right and centre for no apparent reason. We can't be holding the books in warehouses and dusting them off occasionally and hoping they'd sell. Because there's a massive pressure on all of our resources on a planet-wide basis, but also, how are we going to supply? We, we haven't got enough paper. The paper mills are struggling. You can't expect to print books a long way away in China and have a low unit cost and expect it to be here in time. It's not going to happen. And you can't expect the capacity to be there because all the time that we were, were shipping out and saying we've got to have the lowest unit cost, the printers were consolidating and reducing their capacity because there was no business. Push that together with the pandemic and the need for localized su supply and with the pressures that are coming on. We have to be much more efficient in what we do. I know Stephen's going to talk um, about the physical supply chain. We really have to get our act together. And we have to look to just-in-time local supply. This is not a pitch for POD. Not by any stretch, but it is part of the story. 
in terms of not putting books into containers that have quadrupled, magnified in, in the cost. And also, we can't actually get the boats to, to move where they need because the pandemic isn't over. Okay. Economy, this is a good one. Trade, well, we couldn't be in a more uncertain time, could we? But that's, that's actually something that you know, I think is a challenge that we can stand up to. We can learn from this. We can reimagine the supply chains and we can all work together, and BIC is a good um, forum for that, to, to really start to reimagine what the supply chain should look like. Yes, there's resource scarcity. I talked about some of that. There's a people scarcity. I've spoken to so many people this week who are struggling to hire the right people with the right expertise. It's everywhere. The great resignation, yes, but within the publishing industry, we now need people to come in that will be trained up who understand the new supply chain, who understand what it's going to take, who are comfortable with data, and they're not just going to put baby in the corner, I suppose is the way to think of it. We've got to get our arms around technology and we've got to get our arms around big data fast so that we can re-engineer our, um, our supply chain and we can understand what the pressures are. Price rises are inevitable. When there is scarcity, prices rise. And it's not just because of the oil and the gas and the war, and I don't want to depress everyone. We've got two hours here, I'm hoping not to. But one of the things that we have to do as an industry is, is to understand that make, when we make decisions about creating content, about creating books and creating products, they have to fit closely with a well-oiled machine of supply one that doesn't have high levels of returns. A number of people are so surprised that you sell books like you sell wine on a sale or return. We have to move away from that. And we have to move to, uh, to a, a place where we understand what the consumers are doing, what that data tells us, so that our publishing is focused and successful to those needs. I'm not saying I've got the answer to this. But it is something that we need to think about. And then the final pillar, you'll be pleased to hear, technology. Again, don't put baby in the corner. Our supply chain is digital. It always has been. I'm always slightly surprised when people say, oh, you're digital, meaning the things that you're involved with are digital. Everything's digital. This is digital. This is digital. Our communication with the supply chain is digital. It has to work machine to machine. You cannot continue to rely on spreadsheets. And I mean retailers at the end, you have to embrace Onyx. I'm going there. And publishers have to embrace the power of metadata to really amplify their sales and to engage with their consumers. It's really simple. Just, for, just do what, what Chris and Graham say. Just do it. Oil it through the wheel. Sales will come as long as you are publishing something that is responding to somebody's needs. But it's entirely possible for you to do that. You've got to get with social. You've got to understand what people's behaviors are telling you, and you've got to understand those consumer behaviors and bring that into to how you're working. And if anyone's signing off saying, oh, well, I'm academic, I don't need to worry about that. Consumers are people, and people are professionals. They are researchers. They are students. They are um, people with leisure activities. A book covers any of this. They have children. They read them. Perhaps they're read too on their Yoto or their Tony or whatever their device is. Digital can be physical at the same time. You've got to have direct-to-consumer strategies. With the shift to online, no one can ignore that. Not engaging and having direct-to-consumer ability to sell is foolish. Not least because you're probably leaving money on the table, but also because you're not learning and understanding about what your customers want. If you, if you move away from data and just say, I'm just going to leave the big people to understand that data, then that's as bad as handing it all over and saying, oh, it's unfair because Amazon seems to know everything that my customers are doing. We have to invest in that skill set. And then finally, um, the move to ebook, ebook continues to rise. Of course, during the pandemic, there was a big, big bubble, but it's continuing to rise. And if nothing else, it's a really great route to discoverability. Omniformat is the route to go. Because with ebooks and many of those platforms, you can start to see the behaviors of what people are doing. If you start to engage there, you can see what's happening, and that can help engage the way, work, work out what you've got to publish and do so in the most efficient way. I think that's me. Okay, not sure I've got many lessons learned. I think my main lessons here are 
You've got to have a slick supply chain. You've got to understand data and get with the data, both the data you put in and the data you get out. Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. Get with those skills, outsource them, bring them in-house, um, but no longer can we run on, on spreadsheets, overprinting, um, dusty bookshelves, um, huge warehouses filled with books that haven't sold in five years. We've got to move on from that. Um, and it's not just my warehouse, uh, not mine, it's John Ingram's, isn't it? Um, our warehouse, or indeed, you know, gardeners as a wholesaler, they don't want stock sitting. They want stock to be churning fast. And the route to that is really for us all to work together. Thank you. Bang on time. Okay, I'd like to introduce Andre Breit. Andre um, is the lead from uh, Nielsen, and he's the managing director, sorry, Andre, and he's going to come and talk to us about consumer trends and what they've actually measured. So here we are, straight onto the trend of data. There you go, Andre. That's going to be... <coughs> It's going to be hard to follow, so I've got lots of slides. I'm going to try to be as fast as humanly possible. I could easily talk for an hour about the pandemic trends, <coughs> but I don't have an hour. I've got kind of 10, 15 minutes. So I'm going to get straight into it. That's a date. Something happened. We were all aware of it. And a lot of things really changed a lot. And it's worth remembering where we were as well. I mean. Uh, we can say the book market was sort of behaving normally pre-COVID, if there is such a thing. And then things really changed a lot, and it's almost impossible to really o o overstate how much it changed. And also those of us who are UK-based don't always, I think, have an, a, a, well, an adequate understanding of how extreme the changes were in some of the markets. So this is a graph of book sales by week, and you'll see it goes to zero there in the purple. So that is the Indian book market, and that was a number of weeks when not one book was sold by any retailer that sends us any data in all of India. That's an almost unimaginable thing to me. So when we talk about lockdowns and what that really means, I mean, that is, it's, yeah, it, it's almost, it's a bit insane, really. And then you can see the happy recovery. But, you know, as I think Ruth said, the pandemic isn't over, but equally, I think even the impact of what happened hasn't really been sort of processed or fed all the way through the supply chains or all the way through how a consumer shops. Um, some post-lockdown real booms occurred, so after, things like that, we've had massive booms and you will see many businesses talk about how well they've done afterwards after having sold no books. There was this massive, you know, pent up demand, much like for lots of us at this book fair. It's really nice to see people and everyone is um, excited, almost uh, overexcited. Uh, so something else that really changed a lot is well, so the dips and then the recovery. So here we look at, at 2020. Then if we look at, you know, 2021, you see huge market growth as that pent-up demand is, is then matched, as then people do all that online shopping and also physical shopping. Uh, only really Australia saw any sort of market decline at all. And again, that's a bit artificial because it was one of the only markets that didn't really have as much of a decrease. So if I f flip back, so the previous year they were up, you know, almost 11%. Normally, if a book market is up 1% or 2% overall, everyone gets really excited. So it is definitely not a normal situation yet. And I gave a similar talk at Frankfurt last year when somebody introduced me by saying, as, as what, well, I think it was something like, now we're in the new normal or out of the pandemic. And I then said, we're not. And I would say the same thing now which is also what R Ruth said. Um, thinking about how a consumer thinks, this is from a wider Nielsen slide, so we are just a book-focused sort of part of the business. They also measure everything from loo roll through to 
um, anything you buy in a shop. And this is out of one of theirs where they sort of trying to talk about how the consumer thinks. And this will continue, I think, as a framework depending on the markets that you think about. So how people are behaving will be impacted. And it does have a big impact on s sustainability because fundamentally a lot of things that have been driven by the pandemic are really unsustainable. We've all known about all the uh, single-use plastic things because they are, well, safer because you don't wash them, but they are not necessarily particularly good for the environment at all. And the consumer has a sort of two opposite um, sort of drivers on them. They want, yeah, they want to protect their personal health and welfare, but they also want to be more sustainable. And those two things have been at odds in many cases. Um, I hadn't seen, seen Ruth's slides, so I'm saying some of the same things in a slightly different graphic, so I'm not going to repeat it particularly. If I talk a little bit about the sorts of books which have sold. It isn't surprising that fiction has done well. Everybody would like to maybe not be so serious. And young adult fiction also doing really well. So here, if we look at the um, market split, well, there's a lot of data in this kind of chart and it's a bit small as well, so I'm gonna try to talk about it. So. We can see politics, history, and business, which are not your traditionally big subjects, but a lot has happened in the world, and the consumer's taste is reflected in that, so people are interested in those, in those things. And if we look here, you can see the backlist doing hugely well. So again, when Ruth was talking about the internet, effectively everything is available forever. So the backlist is no longer what the backlist used to be like. And if you look over here, Oh. <laughs> you can see that the, the pub year is basically getting later. So the, it is a slow change over time, but it is a marked sort of difference. So the consumer isn't, isn't necessarily buying new books. They're often finding an old book, and this is where metadata, search engines, and the internet is so hugely important, where people are finding whatever they're interested in and then buying it. If we look at the UK book market, I think we can be really happy how well it has recovered. I think almost better than expected, really. Um, and it is a range of things, so it's easy to only look at the kind of best sellers as I have put them there, but that's also why I wanted to talk about the backlist. So overall, the UK book market has really recovered and had one of its best years since all records began. And we as an industry should be really happy that our product remains to be so, so, so popular with consumers. Ebooks did have huge growth initially, especially, I mean, if you can't get a physical book, you're going to buy an ebook. And if you can't go to a physical shop, you're going to buy it online. But audio has really continued f faster growth and for a longer period of time. Um, I'm also not, uh, you know, qualified to actually talk about what is a podcast versus a radio show versus an audio book. But at some point, someone's going to have to decide at which point is a podcast and, well, an audio book. I'm looking at Graham here. Maybe he can... He can. <laughs> but it would be interesting if you actually included sort of podcasts as to... If you think about the consumer's sh share of time of what they're doing with their time. Audio is a significantly larger market than I think we all realize. And what I want to show here, I will just put it up. There's a lot of stats on it, my apologies. Anybody who wants the presentation, I can email it to you after, so you yeah, don't have to try to write it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if you have a look here, 41% e-tailers, 42% e-tailers. So this is effectively attempting to compare sort of two largely different age groups or what we might think is very different. And in some ways they are very different and other ways they're not so different at all. So um, it's, I suppose my statement is 
sort of don't make assumptions about your consumer. Actually ask your consumer. They might not behave how you expect them to. And what influences them to actually buy a book? Um, unsurprisingly, the subject of the book is very high up. The author, the blurb, um, the price is not the highest item. And it has never been. Um, I think historically books are actually underpriced, really. And they are really, really good value for money as a product. We're talking about sustainability and a greener world. The whole world is interested in them and it's reflected in what people are buying. Okay, maybe Clarkson's Farm is not particularly an in environmental program, but you know, if you look at the books, some of these things would not have sold as well in the past as they are selling now. If you dig a little bit further into it, there is a huge interest in the environment. You can see it in the books that people are buying. And then current affairs, you can't really get away from it, much like Ruth, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to depress us, but I mean, people are buying and reading about how the world has, has reached the point where it is. Economics is more interesting to people, perhaps, than it's ever been before, again. So assuming that your consumer is only interested in one thing, I think is a really false, false dichotomy. Self-help books, which I personally have never really particularly liked, but they do, they do continue to be hugely popular. And also, actually, the definition of what is a self-help book has really changed over time. And again, something that I think we should all remember. Mind, body, spirit, health, these are all subjects that really the pandemic focused people on, and you can see it in their purchasing. And within self-help, you can see sort of clear trends or overlaps in between all these areas. So it isn't only one main thing. However, memoirs do remain popular. We do like people that we know. And leisure and lifestyle, similarly, uh, we all had lockdown projects or lockdown hobbies, and Ruth sort of briefly mentioned the great resignation or items like that. I think a lot of us have realized that maybe what we were focusing on was not the right thing, and we've all decided to have other things that we look at. And if there isn't too much for you to do, um, I'm sure we all either bake some kind of banana bread or sourdough starters were particularly popular at one point. But food and drink has really benefited hugely, and it's also really diversified. So it has really changed how people, I think, shop there. And that was my whistle stop tour. I hope I'm not too far over time. Ruth hasn't told me off yet. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Ruth, uh, and thank you, Andre. My God, lots of data in your presentation. So, let me first introduce uh, the IPA, the International Publishers Association, which I represent here. I was for two years vice president and president. I'm now chair of inclusive publishing and literacy. So, the IPA is a NGO. It's based in Geneva. It's an umbrella organization of publishing organizations in many different countries. So, here in the UK, there's the UK Publishers Association, which is a member of the IPA. And as such, it's the largest international organization representing publishers everywhere. We fight for copyright, which is the bedrock of industry, of course. 
uh, at the same time, we are also an NGO with a human rights mandate, and we fight for freedom to publish. In that sense, it's a pretty unique trade organization. So, talking about sustainability, there are key, two key areas where I think publishers and publishing organizations really have to get involved. And the first one is to get our own house in order. Um, so, as we say here, being a responsible organization. So, for instance, the way you employ folks, um, how do you do DNI on the work, uh, work floor, uh, and also your environmental practices in your companies and uh, publishing organizations yourself. The second way is that we as publishers can be catalysts of societal change through what we publish. It's in our content, it's our books, in our journals, etc. And I think that's extremely powerful and an opportunity that of course publishers have embraced but could embrace even much more in this area of sustainability. We at the IPA, we put the sustainability and the SDGs high on the agenda and we also have a beautiful resource center which you see here where we exchange for instance best practices. So if you want to learn about specific SDGs or what you can do, it is go there and then you find exactly kind of the, the recipes how to get started. Oh, it goes automatically, well even easier. Um, a year and a half ago in Frankfurt, we launched the uh, SDG Publishers Compact um, and that is kind of addressing the question, I am in a publishing house or I am in a publishing organization, I want to start with the SDGs, uh, but there are 17 and they're very complex, I don't really know what to do. So there are 10 extremely concrete points. Um, what is great is that uh, uh, lots of people, lots of organizations signed up. And here, I think it was yesterday, at the London Book Fair, we signed up uh, number 200, which was actually the London Book Fair itself. Here you see all the people that already signed up, or organizations, I should say, and lots of them actually are in the SDM group. So apparently science publishers, uh, they, they feel uh, they really need this kind of compact uh, to get started with the SDGs. Now, what are they? And you see it here. So there are three main buckets. It's first that that you com commit to the sustainability and you make it a priority, you raise awareness, and then of course you take action. More concretely is for instance, you say that uh, the SDGs are part of your policies and you, you show about it in the, on your website. Um, it's important for your staff, so internally, but also externally, you communicate about it, but then you also take action. You organize uh, activities, inside of your own organization, but also within your city, within your region, and within your country. Anyway, so if you haven't signed up for the SED Publishers Compact, I can highly recommend it. Focusing on climate, and I'm not telling anything new, we all know that because of the higher greenhouse gas emission, the temperature is rising, and if we do not cap that, we will end up with an uh, unstable climate. It's time to take action now, and we're not on track. So we need to get what we call the race to zero, to be net zero, to, uh, so that we re to reach carbon neutrality. Of course, there is the, the Paris Agreement, and for everybody that signs and, and left and, and signed up again, uh, it's a very strict agreement where you commit yourself to be net zero by 2050. Um, but it doesn't mean so that will be very smooth sailing. Um, and we must also be aware that there are quite different perspectives from the global north to the global south. Who are we in the global north who have been contributing to most of the, the carbon in the, in the atmosphere to tell countries in the global south they cannot kind of use their assets for, for instance, economic growth uh, and, and have investments from oil and gas for their uh, education system or, or innovation locally. Anyway, so it's a very tall uh, target which we must reach. And then the question is, what can we do as publishers? And of course, we st we're not starting from scratch. We already have a pretty good track record, what we do with a certain kind of paper and printing. And we've heard publishers that say, yes, we are committing. Uh, Bertelsmann and Penguin Random House, they will be carbon neutral by 2030, which I think is great, very ambitious target. Elsevier, the company where I work, and Springer Nature, they went for 2040. 
And Rachel and I, we are responsible for that program and, and we will deliver. We still have some time, but still also we found out it, it's an ambitious target. We must be uh, upfront about it. It is definitely an opportunity. This year, 2022, is really the year where we have to take action. We cannot say, let's discuss this for a couple more years because we are running out of time here. And climate is linked to many other SDGs. It's, for instance, linked to inequalities. It's linked to life you know, above, uh, on land and life in oceans, etc., etc. It will require a completely new way of working, a sustainable mindset, so to say. We had an excellent sustainability summit in Frankfurt uh, last year. And what I really like about this picture is like everybody in the book sector was, was represented. Not only publishers, publishing organizations, but I see here the library community, I see the Federation of European Publishers, I see IBI for uh, young adults, um, the booksellers, of course. So, and that's kind of broad coalition we do need to achieve uh, net zero. And I think that was it, and I give the floor over to Rachel. Thanks very much, Mikhail. Um, so I'm Rachel Martin, I'm the Global Director of Sustainability and I chair the Big Green Supply Chain Committee. And I thought just to follow on from that sort of international setting that Mikhail um, outlined is, well, why do we need to work across our supply chain? And just to share some of our learnings at Elsevier and to give you a flavor about where we're coming from. And as Mikhail said, the environment has always been on the agenda. We've always looked at it, I mean, BIC has done great work in terms of, you know, accreditations, making sure that we looked at things like paper and recycling and waste. And I think what was really interesting there is that the focus has always been about being more efficient, saving costs. Perfectly reasonable objection, uh, ob objective. And it was about sourcing responsibility. You know, most people have a modern slavery act. Um, you know, we, we, we want to be responsible companies. But climate's slightly different to this kind of approach that we've had towards environment so far. Because climate action actually has a different categorization. It's not just about looking at, oh, here's one element, which might be paper, or here's one element, which might be your location, or here's another element of something else. It's actually looking at a very strict categorization of where your emissions sit. Um, the Greenhouse Grass Protocol is the reporting framework of which companies, organizations across every sector across the world will categorize their carbon emissions and they're called scopes, which is really weird. I really hate that word, but it's scopes. Um, there's three scopes. The first one are direct emissions from company owned resources. So these are your locations. Um, these are things like your lease cars. The second one, weirdly, is indirect emissions which are purchased, which are renewable, um, which is your heat and your purchased um, electricity. And then the third one is indirect that you have no control over. So these are things like how your staff might commute to work, um, things like your supplies, your investments, um, all of those kind of elements. And what's interesting about that is that if we track what that looks like in terms of a carbon footprint of a company or an organization, this one um, is Elsevier, but I can bet my bottom dollar that pretty much every publisher and every organization is at the same kind of categorization of their carbon footprint. And you can see scope one, scope two, very minor. Most people will have already made those savings because we've all been responsible. We all wanted to save costs. We all want to be as efficient as possible. So those savings are not very big, so to speak. Scope three is kind of, I like to divide it up because business travels in there. Most of us come to London Book Fair. I don't know how you got here. I came by the Eurostar. Um, and you will increasingly see people look at alternative modes of transport to get around. I'm really impressed. Elsevier, we, we signed the climate pledge, so we're net zero by 2040, 10 years ahead of the Paris uh, Declaration. But we also had a climate target that came in for business travel. And I'll give you a flavor of just how big that chunk is. In 2019, the average Elsevier flyer within our company emitted nine tons of carbon emissions, nine tons. Now, if you consider by 2030, we need to, across your whole lifestyle, not just your personal you know, work or you know, home lifestyle, across your whole lifestyle need to be about 2.5. So just for business travel, we were doing nine. 
So we really had to cap that and we decided, okay, we're going to do a 50% reduction. Um, so that's something within our control and that's why it's somewhat separated. That massive chunk is scope three, that's supply chain. And that's an area where you have to work together. At Relic, so that's our, our parent company, we've been doing carbon reduction since about 2010. We have set a scope one, scope two, science-based target, which basically makes sure that you're in line with the Paris emissions profile. And we've made significant change. COVID has been really great at this because <laughs> suddenly we weren't occupying all the offices, so your heating went down, and we weren't travelling as much. And so the 2021's not on here, but we've reduced it for about 75%, and that's our direct emissions. But that big chunk, that scope three, that's the issue, and that's what McKeel referred to, is that we had a bit of a leap of faith. You know, there are some lessons that we've learned. Because we've worked it out specifically for Elsevier what kind of categories we had. And the main categories of emissions, now if you consider Elsevier is a, an academic publisher, most of our journals are online, um, most of our business is digital. The biggest category for us, physical journals. So the smallest revenue bit actually has a huge carbon impact. And that's why it's different to looking at it when you think about it from the traditional environmental perspective. Because you might say, well, we don't use that much paper. But if you look at through the carbon emissions, that's a big chunk. Um, we also had editorial, business travel, as I said, we were a little bit loose with our business travel, um, content creation, facilities, homeworking and commuting, um, another really big one. So I get a lot of questions around, okay, what does the future of work going to look like? If we're not in offices or perhaps we come back to that couple of days in the office kind of situation, consolidating floors, um, thinking about what that means and also calculating what a homeworking environment would be on your carbon emissions. Um, again, really interesting discussions to be had there. Infrastructure is really interesting. So at Elsevier, of course, we had a lot of questions. and was like, oh my God, your data hosting must be huge. That must be the biggest chunk. And actually it's not because, you know, we've got really responsible data servers. They're all there. It's actually quite minor. Another one I want to flag, pensions. Um, it's quite small compared to other ones, but it's such an ethical discussion with the people in your organisation. You know, people want green investment options. We have to make sure as an ethical company, responsible company, that we are making sure that we are not fueling fossil gas um, uh, investments as well. And there was a whole heap of other. And what we learned from doing all of this was a couple of lessons. First of all, we want consistency. There's no absolute method to calculate your carbon emissions. I always thought it was an exact science, but when you get into it, the data isn't there. We're not sophisticated enough. And that goes for just over the supply chain, but also within Elsevier. We don't know how our staff commute to work because we've never had to ask them nor record it. <laughs> and when you join a company, you might be thinking, oh, okay, I joined a nice company. You know, not many times will you have to declare how you're going your primary mode of transport. So there's some changes which I think can piggyback on COVID about how we engage, how we use our employees, how we kind of move forward. And there's some trade-offs that have to happen there. If we don't make some savings in some areas which seem quite reasonable, I mean, Ruth, you were talking about book returns. I mean, these are kind of big areas. They're chunky, they're meaty. I'm sure there's lots of issues. But if we don't take those, you have to have some trade-offs which become really uncomfortable. There are some business practices that we will not be able to change. So it feels like we need to make sure that we as hard as it might be, but we have to kind of think through, okay, where can we make the most impact and do that and do it quickly? The other thing is that we had to kind of start talking to our suppliers and we've got 1,500 suppliers at Elsevier. So, you know, the bigger the company, the harder it is for us to kind of get the consistent data that's needed in order to set targets for your supply chain to figure out how you're going to have a year on year decrease on these sorts of things. And what we found really interesting is that when I talked to a small publisher, I was talking yesterday to a small publisher, he's like, oh, we're carbon neutral, we're already done. He's like, I've got two suppliers, I rang them up, <laughs> I told them that I wanted to be there, and he was like, yes, done. And that's what it will be, and that's great. And, and you know, we fully support that. I think for bigger organisations, we need to have that engagement. I mean, we are still quite a niche area, we'll share the same suppliers, so we want to be asking the same questions to them. We want them to supply the same data on it. Um, we had a great question, um, 
yesterday uh, in our session and it was about, you know, okay, reporting. You don't want double reporting. Everybody has to report on their direct emissions, which makes sense. But supply chain's a bit of a wild west at this point. We don't want to be, yeah, inadvertently reporting on different things and we want to be able to compare apples with apples. So your methodology that Elsevier adopts, you want the same methodology to be at Springer Nature and other scientific publishers. And that goes for trade and for education. And so there is this opportunity of working together to figure out what that means. And we're all on the journey. There isn't a solution at the moment that we can hands down say, okay, yeah, we've sold book returns, we've sold book fairs where everyone's sort of shipped all their books here and they're gonna ship them back. We haven't got there yet, we haven't looked at it. Um, we've got some really interesting startups that are thinking through, okay, what is design for recycling? What is a circular economy? Is paper the next thing? How can digital play a role if you really love print or not? Is it a print or not situation? And so those are the discussions that get had at an international level through the IPA's work, and I think uh, more locally through things like the big green supply chain uh, committee as well. Which brings me to the Green Supply Chain Committee. Uh, so 29 members, and it's a really unique group because we've got trade associations next to publishers, next to bookshops, and they're coming together and they have some really good conversations. Um, and we had a work plan that was launched last year, and I'm very happy to see Simon in the room, who's our environmental consultant, who's going to execute on this, which is lovely. Um, and it's based on the seven UN SDGs that basically we feel the publishing sector um, reflects. I won't go into them, but basically climate's on there. Uh, and there's seven categories. So there's things like, you know, making sure that we exchange best practices. Everybody wants to know what everybody else is doing. Looking at things like sustainable consumption and production, looking at um, returns, communications, and of course, looking at the Green Book Alliance. And I know Brian is gonna go into that in more details. So the two projects underway, uh, the first has already been kicked off, environmental accreditation badges. There's a lot of accreditation badges out there. Um, and one of the projects was to map that out. What are they? What do they do? What do they offer? And to have that discussion ultimately at the end to think about, okay, if you're thinking about what is a good supplier in terms of climate, what does that mean? And what's interesting there, and, and, and Simon's in the room, so please go ask him if you have questions about this, is that we also have this element when we're looking at environment that the social sort of came up, human rights, um, the idea that you know, we can't separate that so easily when you're thinking about paper and you're thinking about FFC, you, know, you also have to be thinking about, okay, well, what's their, sub, you know, what's their uh, workers' conditions like? What are their pay? And what does that mean? So that's a really interesting project. The second is the design for recycling project. Um, and that was really to think about um, mapping, I think, <laughs> all the different ways that um, uh, the current life cycle is. So to what, what's happening and where those opportunities might have. So it's really setting those foundational pieces to see what's missing, what could be consolidated, and what could really move forward. And that was it. I hope I'm on time. Thank you, and thanks as well for stepping in today for Karina. We all miss her. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the Green Book Alliance. <clears throat> it actually was formed in 2020. Uh, it's our pandemic baby. It's the uh, collaboration really among Vic, who's taken the lead on it. Uh, I had a chance to talk yesterday uh, at a panel that Mikhail um, moderated to just explain that Karina uh, was going to be working on the, the program that um, BIC is doing and asked uh, just quite uh, directly, would BISG and BookNet Canada want to be part of it? We immediately said yes, and we've been reading more or less every other week um, in the uh, two years since then. Um, each organization obviously is focused on its own market, um, but it's also focused on collaborating wherever we can with the other organizations that are part of this effort. It's currently BookNet, Canada, BISG, and BIC, but we expect we'll have more. 
I mean, the, the, our working uh, slogan is essentially working together towards book industry sustainability for all the reasons that Rachel's outlined and Mikhail as well. Um, it's built on the SGG, S, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, it's a good framework and really uh, guiding a lot of different organizations. Um, we're working to strengthen both the way that change gets implemented, uh, but also to try and create uh, a partnership around the globe across book publishing. Um, the other thing we do is to try and share the, whether it's the knowledge, expertise, technology, and in some cases, financial resources. We want to avoid doing the same thing twice, uh, if we can. Um, that means information sharing. It means joint planning and projects. Uh, it also means that we're, we're going to be doing events like this one, as well as other initiatives that make sense to try and get the word out. Some of the work to date, uh, we've done a global survey of sustainable book practices that actually dates to 2020 and early 2021. Uh, we wanted to try and get out and see if there was a baseline that we could establish. We've created a website, it's called greenbookalliance.org, and we've been sharing information for the last year and a half on it. One of the things that you can find on that site is what we call sustainability profiles. They're actually uh, green supply chain journeys. Um, it's, they're collected on the GBA site. They sometimes appear on, on BIC or BISG or BookNet Canada's site. But it's essentially an individual story about what different companies across the entire supply chain are doing. Uh, and we also provide uh, collective support for programs like this one, and I, I, I know that we'll do more. Uh, some of the things that we're doing for 2022, uh, we're developing industry partner check, what we call checklists for sustainability conversations. So uh, guidelines for a publisher to be able to talk to trading partners to better understand where you both are when it comes to sustainability. Um, we're monitoring and we're building on the work that's underway at BIC in particular. If you're based in the UK, I think you're really quite fortunate. BIC has really taken the lead here. It's doing excellent work. The committee that Rachel's chairing is well ahead of where either BookNet or BISG is right now, so it provides a model for us. Um, we do share information both in and about our, our home markets. Uh, we've been trying to get external resources. One of the things that's a challenge for any, any small association, and we're all small associations when it comes down to it, is having enough resources to be able to hire somebody to do the work. A lot of it does depend on the work of volunteers, but this, particularly when you're doing the kind of research that uh, Rachel outlined that has been done at Elsevier, you've got to staff it, and we're, we're trying to think through that. And as I said, we meet every other week um, during the, we've been continuing it throughout the pandemic to coordinate our plans, set priorities and the like. It's actually one of the really good benefits of the pandemic, if there are a few, uh, is that we've actually created a much stronger partnership among the three organizations, as well as with editor. Uh, Graham Bell uh, joins those calls uh, um, on, not the, the Green Book Alliance, but we get together every other week on the, uh, to fill in the gaps. Um, we had a, a question, the two questions Karina asked me to, to answer. One was, what can the industry do now and what can you as a participant do now? With respect to the industry, um, certainly getting more informed, if you're not already, about the, the nature of the sustainable development goals is really important. Uh, there's a lot of material published. Uh, the resources that Mikhail outlined are a good place to start, but it's, it's the framework that most organizations are already using. Um, there's an opportunity to work within your own market if you're based in the UK with BIC, with us in, in the United States on various market specific initiatives. But there's also um, a, a chance to draw on best practices that may not be in your own market. One of the things I had a chance to say yesterday in talking about this is that um, the collaboration essentially is without borders on this topic. It's, it's not, there are no borders at your company, and ultimately there are no borders uh, for the, your country. Uh, the issues that are, uh, t that are touched upon when we talk about the climate crisis are going to be international and global and on an ongoing basis. And one thing that we keep coming back to, Karina, uh, Noah, and I, is that we want to reduce the number of overlapping efforts, not just between us or among us, but among different companies and organizations. Everybody wants to make really good progress as quickly as possible. Data is important to do on that, to do that. But we also want to try and coordinate among us so we don't wind up doing the same thing multiple times. And then the last question that Karina asked me to answer was, how can you get involved? Um, 
I think one thing is to, uh, to kind of at an individual level, uh, think about what's actually going on and ways to and find ways that you can build on it. Uh, we're not going to solve this crisis only by individual action. That, that's not going to be adequate, but it doesn't hurt. And uh, I think Elsevier is a good example of having built both a culture uh, of, uh, of individual actions as well as uh, a corporate commitment. Um, you want to <clears throat> try and be involved in what's happening in your own market. Uh, volunteers are uh, a significant part of the um, the BIC effort, um, and it's and that's been the nature of, of all three organizations as well as for Editor. Um, but if you can build on those, that's a really good way to get started. Um, make your work visible. Um, the more stories you can tell, the more visibility and, and, and awareness people will have on it. And then ultimately, if, you're, if you feel like your organization has an opportunity to change, talk about it, advocate within it, um, make people more aware. So I think that's about it for the GBA. Thank, Thank you. you I'll repeat the question, if I, if I might, essentially, how do we create alignment both across organizations and, and within an industry? The, a, a, a fairly big piece of what we've been trying to do is build on the efforts like the one that BIC already has in place. The, there are dozens of volunteers that are already uh, actively uh, working on that. We don't have a comparable initiative in the United States, but we need to. And it's, it's the kind of thing that we've uh, opened. We, we started talking to both members and non-members because our organization has, uh, from across the supply chain, about 180 members. That's not a, a it's, it represents the largest companies in the industry, but it's not the whole industry. So we also, um, it's, a, it's been the theme of our annual meeting last year. It's something we'll be talking about in the, the repeat that takes place next month. But it's, uh, I think it's something we could do better. So at the International Publishers Association, um, when we had the sustainability summit, the biggest thing was how do you share best practice? How do we get that communication happening? Because it's not just within you know, different businesses or the different committees, but it's also Printers are telling me that publishers don't know what they're doing and then, you know, the, the, the ink guys are saying they don't know. So there's a lot of sort of miscommunication. So we're actually working on a very exciting project that the Green Book of Alliance will be part of, which is going to be some sort of resource, resource centre. Um, so a one-stop shop where we can kind of um, bring all this together, highlight research, you know, release the wonderful results from Simon's work and, and studies and things like that. So we can kind of create the basis <laughs> to create alignment and, and you know, keep posted because it will be pushed, it will happen. Um, but yeah, hopefully later on this year. Thank you, Ruth. Um, good morning, everyone. There's definitely themes emerging this morning, and I just want to briefly say that I've been in this industry since 1986. Back then, social and environmental concerns really, really didn't feature. The supply chain was considered boring then and taken for granted, and I think it's, it's still taken for granted to a large degree these days, although people are far more aware and attuned to 
supply chain challenges. And the other theme returns. Um, it may sound quite cynical, but back in the day, returns with a get out of jail card for any bad buying decisions. There was always, there was always returns to um, address the issue. And whilst we still have a returns uh, ability these days, I think it's fair to say that people are more sensitive and far more aware of returns and how returns are, are perceived in our industry. Anyway, going back to the fact that the supply chain is considered a bit boring and taken for granted, um, I want to start with a, a quiz. Does anybody recognise the characters on screen? Well, there's a few hands going up. Who would like to call out an answer? Graham? <laughs> you were the first to put your hand up. Uh, it's the Jetsons. It is the Jetsons. It is the Jetsons. And more generally, what do the pictures suggest? I mean, for me, it's, it's about automation robots, may, maybe stress-free working and living. Um, but yeah. No, I don't remember that phrase. <coughs> well, it may still happen. But um, for the uninitiated, this is a, the Jetsons were a cartoon series from the 1960s, Hanna-Barbera Productions, I think. And the Jetsons lived in Skypad Apartments in Orbit City. And they had a housekeeping robot as well as any of the other gadgets that, um, you know, uh, that, that the Jetsons would have. But I think best of all, George Jetson worked one hour a day, two days a week. Now, how good is that? But the, the reason I mention it is that um, it suggests the smart home. And I do think that there's a smart home analogy, analogy to be made with the book industry supply chain. Um, so here we're, we're, we've got a range of areas, tasks that can be can be automated through the smart home. What is the smart home? It's using the, the, the internet to control devices to perform tasks or functions. It's all about control and convenience. And as I say, there's, there's something in the smart home thinking, the logic of the smart home, that I think we could apply or we should be applying to our industry our supply chain. So I'm going to talk about the ordering of physical books in the business to business supply chain. And um, last year, Bick asked me, to, would I lead a project to capture and define what best practice looks like for the ordering of physical books. And there's a number of um, uh, big members that have joined me and supporting me to, to carry out that project. I see a few of them in the audience. Gardner's Books, Simon, Chris and uh, Graham from Editor, Adam from, Adam from Adam Houston Books. And that really the project couldn't have been better timed because our, our supply chain is becoming more complex and more global. Covid and Brexit have simply added to that complexity. And it's also highlighted during the project. Um, this actually came up in a meeting at which uh, Brian from BISG attended, that we take it for granted as supply chain professionals that everyone else in our industry understands the terms and the processes that we talk about and refer to on a day-to-day -to -day basis. And they don't, or not always. So in looking at trying to establish what ordering best practice looks like now, we've also got an eye on the future and 
you know, the, those supply chain colleagues and professionals that are going to come after us and will need to carry on the work of, of the supply chain. And the supply chain can be boring. It is a utility. It's, the utility is a good description. It's taken for granted. Much like gas, electricity and water, we expect it to be there. We, we forget that it's there until it isn't or until something goes wrong. And when it does break down or doesn't provide the quality of service that we do expect, what happens? Well, costs go up, reliability goes down, alternatives are sought, standards are affected. And although our supply chain is deemed reasonably efficient, reasonably technically advanced, given the greater awareness of social and environmental concerns, shouldn't we be endeavouring to make it more efficient, more environmentally friendly, more socially aware? So in keeping with the theme of uh, the other speakers, there are two United Nations Sustainability Development Goals that are underpinning our project. Uh, the first is to in ensure inclusive and equitable quality education. This is thinking about upcoming supply chain professionals in our industry. And ensuring su sustainable consumption and production that harks back to responsible buying and returns practices. Now, consumer behaviour has changed. Andre referenced that earlier, as did, as did Ruth. Um, physical stores were closed for many weeks or months. Lockdowns restricted travel. Online retail was the only form of retail for many. And given that many of us, even before COVID, were quite comfortable and confident to order books, groceries, airline tickets, rail travel online. Um, making more use of technology in our supply chain shouldn't, shouldn't be that much of a challenge. And the smart home is also more prevalent. Again, during lockdowns and COVID, I think it was an opportunity for us to spending so much more time at home to actually delve into the internet of things and, smart, and the smart home. So we're much more adept and confident at controlling, um, controlling household items via the internet at the touch of a button. We're much more adept at creating, um, controlling and doing things for our convenience. So the question is, well, if we're happy doing that in the smart home, is there anything we can learn from the smart home that we can apply to our industry? And I think there is. Um, what we do in the supply chain is fragmented. We all have a particular way of working. We all have particular tools that we, we use on a regular basis. And besides, we all, regardless of that technology, we all st still like human interaction. We may place an order via teleordering or pub easy, but let's be honest, we do like to pick the phone up and check where the order is, when it's going to be dispatched, when it's going to be delivered. And this is where we can learn from the smart home. So this is the next step, smarter ordering, in Bic's role to develop best practice and apply what we're learning or what we have learned during the, the ordering project. And in ter simple terms, smarter ordering is knowing when to use technology to get the best order management result. It's adapting well-established ordering routines to the post-COVID era. It's being more socially and environmentally aware. Now, I, I think somebody described it in one of our, our project meetings. When you place an order for stock, are you placing that order based on the, uh, with the, with the 
and knowing that you could return that stock the majority of the time if needed? Or are you thinking, well, I should assume that order is firm sale, that stock is firm sale, even if it isn't? And putting more thought and effort into what you're ordering and when you're ordering it. Now the supply chain is stretched and the, the, the lines between physical and online retail are blurring. You only have to think of um, buy online, pick up in store to, to see that. So it is time to reconsider what we're doing and how we're doing it. And with that in mind, we need to adapt our approach. We need to take far more control of our ordering and order management decisions. We need to know what our trusted sources of information are, what that information means that we are receiving, and our order management decisions should be based on maximising sales and minimising returns. Just going through the other points, um, smarter ordering, good for a healthy industry, diverse industry as well. So one that is neither solely reliant on physical stores or online retailers, one that is accessible to all book buyers, one that supports a, a, a range of booksellers, publishers, distributors and wholesalers. And by customer service, um, I mean responsiveness, because the reality is that online direct-to-consumer sales are far more consumer-focused than in-store sales. Um, you only have to think of the information that you, you receive to track your order once you've placed it as a, as a direct consumer on a, on a retail website. Not only that, even having placed and paid for the order, you can change the delivery options or with some retailers even cancel the order after you've paid for it. And I think one of the big um, learning points from COVID is that we don't want to see that level of disruption in our industry and in our supply chain again. So we need to be more sensitive to potential disruption in the future, whether it's, a, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's advances in technology, whether it's staff churn, so that we can keep on doing business. So the ordering project briefly kicked off tw 12 months ago, just over, and it's, uh, there are a number of big members participating in the project. I mentioned a few of them earlier. Um, there they are on screen. Some of them are, are represented in the, in the room. And there were upwards of 60 related supply chain, order su and supply chain related issues that we were potentially going to tackle. Um, we force ranked those issues to bring them down to a more manageable level, a more manageable number, and we broke we broke those issues into three main areas. Discovery and ordering was number one. Tracking and visibility of orders, number two. Receiving and follow-up was number three. And we had a vision. Now, there's nothing, there's nothing particularly new or exciting here. There's no Apple moment, but that's the point. This, uh, all too often, we forget some of the basics and um, I'd just like to mention the four rules of efficient order management by um, Hugos published by John Wiley and this neatly sums it up. Hugos pointed out that there were four essentials. First, enter the order once and once only don't leave it to human intervention to get that order to the right place for fulfillment. Make the order status visible. This is what direct-to-consumer organizations do particularly well. 
and use the integrated order management systems. So whether you're looking for a product to order, whether you're ordering it, whether you're tracking it, or even whether you're receiving it, all too often we're having to go to different systems to, to perform the different functions. And then the project team added a fifth. If you can automate the order, if you've got the salient points, uh, the essential information, the ISBN, the order reference, the quantity, the standard address number or identifier for your organisation, bookseller organisation or wholesaler, then you've got a better chance of being able to automate all subsequent transactions and subsequent transactions could be an order acknowledgement, it could be an order re-acknowledgement, it could be an electronic delivery note, it could be an invoice or perish the thought it could be a returns request at some point. So, just going back to the project issues, once we force ranked all of the potential items to tackle these were the, the main topics that came up. Um, so when I talk about metadata, we're talking about completeness, accuracy and timeliness of metadata. When I talk about standardisation, standardisation in approach, standard, standardisation in the approach to ordering, as an example, or the fact that there are a number of standards, some more complete and relevant to today, today's stakeholders than others. Accuracy, efficiency and speed was a, a sort of an overarching issue. In so many ways, accuracy is impeded, efficiency is let down and speed is undermined because we have a, an electronic supply chain that insists on joining up the various electronic tasks with manual intervention, which seems a bit odd these days. So the project is coming to an end, and I just want to say here that we will be making deliverables available via the BIC website and BIC's LinkedIn page, and they will include um, items such as order query FAQs, um, order routines, order management routines, documentation, style guides for orders and invoices. So that's just a flavour of some of the outputs that we're, we're currently starting to make available. So if you're interested or involved in, in ordering in the physical supply chain, that material will be of interest to you. Now today, I want to talk about order management. So out of all of those issues, standardization, metadata, accuracy, speed, timeliness, order management is the one thing I'd like to touch on. And as I said, what stood out for us is the lack of a joined up approach. There's too many instances where we use technology to perform a particular function, but then the follow-up or the next step is a manual process. So let me give you an example, um, ordering related. In commercial relationships between booksellers and, and distributors or wholesalers, the act of ordering, acknowledging the order, actioning or reviewing the acknowledgement to the order, tracking the order and then receiving the order are all individual separate tasks or functions or actions. But they're not. In a way, they're, they're not. It's, they're, it's one process. You place an order, the supplier or wholesaler acknowledges that order, tells you what the status of that order is, which informs when you're going to see the order or not, and the subsequent process to, to book it in. And this was one significant area where we can see opportunity for improvement now. 
So when a bookseller places an order, the distributor or wholesaler will acknowledge it. Some will acknowledge each and every order line, regardless of whether they're fulfilling that order straight away. Some will only acknowledge order lines that they can't fulfill straight away. And the sort of acknowledgement information you get is paperback out of print, hardback available. Item needs to be manufactured on demand, in print and in stock. Rights restricted, not available in this territory for sale. And in our conversations with distributors, with suppliers, um, some said, yes, we supply that acknowledgement information. Others said, no, we don't, but we'd like to, systems changes permitting. Some said, what? What is that information? We're not aware of it. And others um, said, we are aware of it, but as our metadata is accurate and complete, and it never changes, we don't see any value in providing an order acknowledgement to a, to a bookseller when they will always get the book as soon as they order it, which strikes me as being somewhat simplistic and naive. But also, not all booksellers can make use of that data, even if they receive it. It may not be in a, in a format um, that their systems can process or that can be made available in a, a human readable format. So to be fair, there are challenges for both suppliers on the one hand and booksellers on the other. But it gets better because every time a, public, a supplier sends an order acknowledgement, they also send a response code. And that response code, coupled with the order acknowledgement, informs the bookseller of potential next steps or actual next steps. And response codes go along the lines of, yes, we've got your order, we've accepted the order. Or no, we've got the order, but we've not accepted it for a reason. We've got your order, but we can't supply that particular ISBN. We have a substitute that we can send in its place. So whilst the acknowledgement might tell you that a paperback is out of print and that there is a hardback edition available in its place, it's the order response code that comes with it that actually gives you the power to start making informed order management decisions. And you can agree ahead of time with your supplier what actions to take in particular scenarios. So in the case of a product having to be substituted, you could agree with your supplier that in the case of a substitution, the order response will be order line not accepted, order cancelled, because the item you wanted isn't available. Or it could be that there is a substitution and you're happy to take that substitution in lieu of the originally ordered product. And this is where the smart home analogy comes in, because much as you can control the temperature in your home so that when it falls to a certain, below a certain temperature, you set the heating to automatically come on, so you can with order management. If you can interpret and understand what order acknowledgement and order response information you're getting, you then have the opportunity to automate those responses remove the manual intervention and work in a much more hands-off, automated way. So in terms of where we've got to in, the, in, in our project so far, particularly learning, looking at order management, we have a lack of order integration, a need for greater automation, inaccurate and consistent data where transactional information is concerned, 
And we know that queries undermine confidence. And where queries undermine confidence, that leads to uh, um, a lack of confidence in technology and a, the urge or the desire to pick up the phone and check on availability, check on order status. So we're focusing on transactional data, on better use of acknowledgements and order response codes. We also want to use the, encourage the use of self-service ordering platforms that have a, a range of um, not just ordering tools but order tracking tools and I'm thinking GuardLink, Gardeners.com, Batchline, PubEasy, Teleordering amongst others here. So finally, just going back to the theme of returns. Um, in 1997, the PABA uh, commissioned a, a report by KPMG that estimated the cost of returns back then as 100 million pounds a year. And out of that came the BIC Industry Returns Initiative, which was a across um, a cross industry initiative to standardize automate and speed up the returns process and i mention it now given uh, our increased awareness and sensitivity to environmental concerns because BIC is also undertaking a review all of this is also reviewing all of the support materials for the industry returns initiative to make sure that the rules governing IRI are clear and unambiguous. And we're also supplementing or going to supplement these materials with a, uh, a new set of documents, process flow, glossary and worked examples to bring clarity to what can be quite a complex um, initiative. So look out for further updates on industry returns later this year. Um, we do intend to publish the collateral online and also introduce some online tutorials around IRI. And just harking back to the ordering project, on screen you can find the links to uh, resources. Those resources will expand over the coming weeks as we put more collateral online. And that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth, and a particular thanks from the audience to you for stepping in at the last minute and hosting this session. I want to, uh, with my colleague Chris, talk about publishing standards and the way that sometimes they can help you in delivering the sustainability that Mikhail and Rachel were looking for. Uh, a few words before we start about Editor itself. We are a not-for-profit trade association like BIC itself, like BISG. Uh, we try to develop, support, maintain uh, the standards that the industry uses uh, for communication between publishers, retailers, and all sorts of other intermediaries. Uh, that develop, support, promote, maintain bit is Interesting because the develop is the easiest bit. Creating standards is actually relatively straightforward. The difficult bit is socializing those standards, getting those standards supported, adopted, and in our case, supported and adopted across as much of the world as we can manage. Uh, so promotion and support is actually more important than develop. Almost any standard will help your businesses because it encourages you to do those predictable, automated things. But we need to support them and promote them to make sure that everybody does the same predictable, automatable things. Uh, we are best known for the development of Onyx 
and Thema will be saying a little about both of those and how they can, on occasion, help you with the sustainability agenda. We are, like BIC, based in London here, but unlike BIC, our membership is uh, global. Our standards that we develop, the things that we support, we try very hard to be a global organisation. In so far as an organisation that has three and a half staff can be global, I believe we are. Much more important, though, is that our membership and support comes from right across the global supply chain. Yes, we have publishers. Yes, we have libraries. Yes, we have retailers who are members of Editor. But those publishers and libraries and retailers are spread right across the globe. So I want to say a few words about Onyx. And we'll try to keep this non-technical. Some of you will have a very deep knowledge of Onyx itself, as some of you may be entirely new to it. Uh, Onyx is an XML framework. It's uh, a container for metadata about your project. Very detailed metadata for your publishing project. First of all, comprehensive bibliographic information. So the publisher can let the retailer and the library know what kind of product it is. Is it digital? Is it print? Is it hardback? Is it paperback? How high is it? How thick is it? How many pages has it got? What subject is it about? That rich bibliographic information is what most people think about in terms of metadata. But it's only one of three ingredients that go into Onyx. The second one is marketing collateral. Because there's no point in a publisher delivering information about a product to a retailer, but not also giving that retailer the best chance to market and promote that product to the retailer's retail customers. So Onyx typically includes that bibliographic data, but also a rich swathe of marketing information collateral as well. And then thirdly, of course, to support the sorts of supply chain things that Stephen's been talking about, we have all the commercial information of who are the wholesalers, who are the distributors, how much are those wholesalers and distributors going to charge the retailer, and how much will the retailer have to charge the consumer? How quickly is that distribution going to happen? The combination of those three things makes Onyx, Onyx a fairly comprehensive, but therefore also quite complicated message. Uh, almost all the large, mid-sized publishers use Onyx. Uh, smaller ones are beginning to. But the important point for me often is that we can do this, even a small organization can do this on a largely global basis. Onyx was designed from the outset to work with books in any language, to work with metadata in any language. In fact, also any script, any writing system. It doesn't matter whether you're using Cyrillic. It doesn't matter whether you're using Arabic. It doesn't matter whether you're using Chinese or Japanese graphic characters. Onyx will still work and indeed is used in all of those markets. It's the best way to communicate your product details. The thing that the pandemic has taught us that relates to metadata, amongst many other things, is it's taught us about the enormous demand for very high quality data. If bookshops are closed, everything is being delivered remotely. The book itself is not the best way of selling the book. The metadata is the best way of selling the book because it's only the metadata that's present when somebody's doing their online shopping. As consumer behavior has changed, the need for that high quality metadata, timely, accurate metadata, has become ever greater. And there's new challenges, of course, that have come alongside the pandemic. Challenges of sustainability, challenges of climate change. And the point I want to make on the next slide is about the fact that sometimes metadata can affect those things as well. A good metadata demonstrably increases sales. But my point is that the things that consumers are looking for are changing. Yes, they were looking for all that bibliographic information. Yes, consumers were looking for all that marketing collateral. My belief is that they will begin to look for credentials of sustainability. 
They will prefer products that come from companies that can demonstrate their progress towards net zero or even beyond net zero, who can demonstrate their commitment to the sustainability goals and that sort of thing. Those known and well understood and reliable credentials should help sales in the future. And so we want to make sure that our metadata communication methodology, ONIX, can carry information about those sustainability credentials. Onyx has already been able to do some of these things for many years. So, for example, if you as a publisher print your book using a certified paper, FFC paper or PEFC paper, then you can put the logo on the book, and you probably do. But you should also be putting information about that paper type into the metadata, so that, for example, retailers could choose to stock more environmentally uh, responsible paper books in their stores. The more information, the more you can gradually teach the whole of the supply chain to respect those environmental credentials. We have newer options in Onyx to, for example, highlight the use of greener ink or greener adhesives. Now, in terms of greener adhesives, we're thinking about uh, adhesives uh, and inks, actually, that uh, perhaps don't emit so much volatile organic compounds uh, when they're used. But the jury's out, for example, on whether mineral-based or organic inks are the most green, but at least you don't want too many of those VOCs. The metadata can also highlight digital options where they are greener, so buy your ebook instead of the print book. It's not just a commercial decision about the price, that can also be a decision about environmental sustainability. And the new thing we're working on, in collaboration with organisations like the Green Book Alliance and with Simon's work as an environmental consultant for BIC, is that we are beginning to incorporate options in Onyx that allow those publishers and other intermediaries, maybe even also the wholesalers, the distributors, we're beginning to allow them to display those environmental credentials. By giving places in Onyx where they can put an environmental statement, places in Onyx where they can point to the results of their carbon audit. A couple of examples. Um, this is uh, a little chunk of that XML-based Onyx. This is a very small part of an Onyx record, but it demonstrates here the fact that this is a paperback. Uh, here, the fact that this is printed on FSC certified paper uh, with the chain of custody number there uh, so that you know who can check up on it. And then at the bottom, this represents the fact that the paper chosen for this product has 55% uh, pre- or post-consumer waste recycled into it. So this is not new paper, it's just over half recycled. And that's the sort of thing that retailers and maybe even customers should have demonstrated to them so they can make informed choice about the products they buy. Uh, next one. Uh, this is one of the newer additions to Onyx, and this is the ability for a publisher or possibly a supplier, like a distributor or wholesaler, uh, to incorporate into the Onyx information about their uh, climate neutrality or sustainability uh, status. It's very generic at the moment. It is just a, currently a single web link that will go to a statement about the publisher or about the supplier. What we want to do is build this out so that publishers can um, state more detailed versions of their climate credentials. If Elsevier, in their uh, climate auditing, or greenhouse gas emissions auditing, uh, has um, demonstrated their progress, then retailers should know about that. And they can know about that through the Onyx. And ultimately, consumers, I think, will begin to care about that as well. We do intend to build on the conclusions of Simon's work there with the uh, green um, supply chain group. 
Now, I'd like at this point to hand over to uh, my colleague Chris, who'll tell you a little bit about what Thema is doing in this area. Thank you, Graham. So, <clears throat> for those of you who've not come across Thema yet, um, it's the subject category scheme that's being used in the global supply chain. Um, it's designed to be used for both physical and digital products, uh, books and audiobooks. Um, it's made up of subject codes and qualifiers. It's uh, used in many markets, in many languages, and by many different players. And you can use Thema subject codes to highlight content um, that links in with sustainability. Theme is very good on issues around diversity, inclusion, equality, social justice, accessibility, but also about sustainability. So there are many subject codes that you can use to highlight um, sustainable content. <clears throat> we have documentation that you can look at on our website that illustrates the use of Thema and Onyx for highlighting content around topics of diversity, inclusion, and equality. But I wanted to look at a particular aspect of Thema. So for those of you who are familiar with Thema, there are subject codes and there are qualifiers. Those qualifiers are used with the subject codes to give extra detail about the content of the book. So we have qualifiers for place. This book takes place in this, in this particular country, or it's about this country. Language, it's about this language. Time period, it's about this period of time, or is set in this period of time. Educational purpose, it's for secondary education, it's for adult continuing education, etc. We have style qualifiers, it's about artistic types, but we also have um, a whole set of interest qualifiers. And within those interest qualifiers, that's where you'll find a lot of the information about um, uh, topics like diversity and inclusion. But we're also going to be adding two new qualifiers. <clears throat> There's about to be a new iteration of Thema, Thema 1.5. It will be released at the end of this month. And in that uh, new release, there are these two new qualifiers. One relating to non-stereotypical gender roles. That came out of a UK-based project looking at the children's market, not only in books, but in toys, clothing, etc. And there's a second one we've added relating to the UN Sustainable Development Goals to allow you to highlight content to do with that. <coughs> These codes, both of these codes, 5YA and 5YS, will fit in with the UN SDG goals, but the 5YS is very specifically to highlight these titles. So, as you may be aware, there are, pub there are reading lists that, um, as Mikael pointed out earlier, the IPA is working with the S UN SDG goals, there's a group that works on that, and that group is producing official book lists. And so there are many books that they choose, they curate, and they publish uh, a list of relating to each of the 17 goals. So for example, they've just published Life on Land, a list of books. These book lists are aimed at the children's market, so that's one of them. You can also use these Thema qualifiers for books that are about SDG goals. So this is a book, this particular book is looking at the concept of the SDG goals. This would fit in with goal number 17. This one <coughs> is taken from another of the lists. There are lists that are available in several languages, official languages, all the official languages of the United Nations, which is Arabic, Chinese, French, Russian, Spanish, French, and English. There are also regional groups. There's an African group. There's, which is publishing lists in Arabic, English, French, and Kiswahili. And there's also a Brazilian group, a Norwegian group, and an Indonesian group. All of those are official uh, SDG groups, and the IPA curates those lists and publishes books on all these lists. That one's taken from the poverty. Number one, this one's on the uh, poverty list. As I said, you can also use these for books that are about SDG goals. This is taken from the Norwegian list and links into the Zero Hunger list. Uh, this book from Maurice, from the Ile de Maurice, um, is to do with gender equality. 
And all of these can use that qualifier. And that qualifier can be used by publishers, by distributors, by wholesalers, and by retailers, by uh, librarians, to find all the books that are either on an SDG official list or about one of the SDGs. That's how those qualifiers work. So they work across adult and children, across fiction and non-fiction. So it's a very good tool for finding all those books. This is what, um, so I've taken one of those books and I've made some suggestions for the thema codes and the thema qualifiers. If you were sending this in your metadata, it's just those codes in yellow that will be included in the Onyx, the XML that Graham showed you earlier. So we've got some subjects. So if you're looking for books about sustainability and green issues, we have a children's code for that. Um, this is also, would go in the biography section, but key, we have that qualifier to link them. We also have other qualifiers. So if I'm looking for every children's book that's about Kenya, I have that qualifier as well. And within the Onyx, we have methods so that you can say, this one is on this particular, this is on one of the official lists. Because these, these reading lists are official lists, so there's a way in Onyx of saying this is officially recommended on the SDG 15 reading list by the SDG Book Club. You can also give a link you can cite the, that, book club, that book list and give a link to, to show people where they can find the rest of those books. Those qualifiers are about linking data and the subject codes also provide possibilities for discoverability and a linking across data. And I just wanted to highlight something else about linking data. So this is um, a biography of a Nobel Peace Prize winner. There are lots of resources available about her, there are books, but there are also films, and there are things like the ISNI, the International Standard Name Identifier, that can be used to link across different forms of data to find all the books. And as I said, you can also use these qualifiers um, for books that are about either particular SDGs, or in this case of this one, this is about the whole SDG program. Um, and in, again, within the other metadata within the Onyx, you're going to include a book description that's going to explain why this book is using the SDG um, qualifier. And these, will be, this, these slides are going to be all available to you afterwards. These are some useful links. And to Graham. I uh, don't normally do this, but uh, this little part of the talk is slightly personal. Um, when I was at school, I read this book. This book is 50 years old this year. Some of you may have read it. Some of you may have dismissed it as crackpot, overly apocalyptic journalism. I think that was a review I read. Um, it was published in 1972. The results of a study commissioned by the Club of Rome and done by a bunch of scientists at MIT. It was uh, one of the first, I guess, serious studies that used uh, computer modeling of the economy as a tool to predict the future. I think I was 13 when I read this. Uh, it, had a, it was a very impressionable age, clearly. It had a very salutary effect upon me and has colored my political views uh, over many, many years. Uh, Dana Meadows, uh, one of the lead authors, uh, became a, a minor hero and, or heroine, I suppose, at the time, a crush of mine, I suppose. Uh, but she was an academic at MIT and uh, led the reviews of this book. Views of this book have veered wildly. When it was first published for about the first 10 minutes, it was the greatest book ever. And then very quickly, that book was viewed, as I said, as as overly apocalyptic. It, it, reviews of the book verged into ridicule at times. But over the years since then, it has become more and more accepted. Current scientists often look at this and say, yes, it's dated, it's 50 years old. But the business as usual scenarios described in this book are frighteningly close to the world that we see today. This book, and perhaps this is overly apocalyptic, predicted societal collapse under business-as-usual scenarios during the 2030s. We've only got 10 years left. We do, as Rachel and Mikkel um, said, 
have to do something. Because on top of this, what this book didn't predict was the climate crisis. At the time, in the early 1970s, scientists were actually worrying about the oncoming new ice age. How stupid does that look now? However, it's colored my life, my political views, uh, quite a bit. This is editor's office. This building is not editor's office. This tiny bit of it is editor's office. Um, we have a story to tell about sustainability. It's not a great story, but it's okay. We work, as you see, in a 125-year-old factory. This was a bus factory. Um, our electrical power comes uh, largely, but not wholly, from the solar panels that cover the entire roof of our office. All the staff work within, all three and a half of them, work within walking distance of the office. Day-to-day -day staff travel is entirely either walking or public transport. And we've made the decision to offset our future air travel. Now, we made that decision about a week before the lockdown was announced, so we haven't actually done any offsetting yet because we haven't need to. But on the bad side, and that, that's a relatively good story, but on the bad side, our office heating it is powered by fossil fuels. It's gas heating. Uh, the building insulation is poor. This is a 125-year-old factory. They didn't think about insulation then. So it's not the ideal story from our point of view. However, despite that, we do need to do something. And so I'll loop back to uh, something that was discussed, discussed earlier by Mikhail and Rachel, and that is the uh, United Nations Sustainability, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Yes, the 17 goals. They actually break down into nearly 150 sub-goals. And it may be worth reading them because some of them will cry out to you as being relevant to your company, whether you're a publisher, distributor, or a bookseller. Uh, but to make it easier to understand and to make it more approachable, uh, there is a smaller group of organizations that have committed to the Publishers' Compact. Now, there are compacts in other industries as well. There's one for the, the broader media, uh, for example. And the compact is designed to do nothing more than inspire action during this decade. It was launched, as was said, about 18 months ago. And to become part of the compact, you commit to it. You make a pledge to do something. There are no demands on what that something is, so long as it's in support of anyone or multiple of those SDGs. Mikhail mentioned there were 10 key goals. Now, I've taken those goals, I've, I've reordered them slightly, so they're not in the same order as the United Nations specifies them, and I've reworded them slightly. The first one, committing publicly to the SDGs and to the compact. That's your first step. It also says things like, you should try to nominate a single person in your organization to monitor, to report on, and to uh, encourage progress against uh, the, the aims of the compact and of the Sustainable Development Goals. You do commit, when you sign up, to producing some kind of annual report showing that progress. Uh, becoming an advocate for the SDGs to the rest of your supply chain is important. Rachel pointed out scope three when you're doing your climate or carbon auditing, most of your emissions actually happen outside your own company. They happen as a result of either manufacturing or distributing or using your products. And so that collaboration is important, but I'll highlight the last two. Dedicating a budget and taking some specific action. If the compact is about anything, it's about inspiring that to happen. The rest are all words. But this is just practical stuff that we need to do. I want to end with that, and I would hope that almost all of you would feel able to sign up to the Publishers' Compact. Spot number 201 is probably still available. Thank you very much. That's the URL you need.
schema is just about subject coding. So it's one aspect that's embedded inside Onyx. Onyx describes every aspect of your product. The schema is just one aspect, and then it's embedded inside Onyx. All right? Uh, if, if you want to discuss more, then we're very happy to. I suppose I should say yes, but no. Um, <laughs> Thema is an avowedly commercial subject classification scheme. It works alongside BISAC. It is replacing a number of other subject classification schemes. Uh, BIC, for example, has its own subject classification scheme, but it's announced, well, it hasn't actually done any development work on that scheme for 12 years. It announced, uh, five years ago that uh, BIC recommends everybody moves to using Thema, and it announced a month ago uh, that BIC would reach the end of its natural life two years from now. Uh, so Thema is taking over from some subject category schemes, but you asked specifically about Dewey. Dewey is uh, optimized for use in libraries, and, and often academic libraries. Uh, Thema is not a scheme for academic libraries. I would say, though, that librarians, librarians will find it very in useful if, you, if they can get access to the Thema codes, because especially in public libraries, there's a lot more information in the commercial sector about DEI themes, so it's useful. But Dewey itself is, is not going to be replaced by that. Public libraries may use schemes like Thema or BISAC. Thank you both. No one was to stop at all. I'd like to thank all of the speakers. Uh, can we just have one round of applause uh, for everybody? And thank you very much for attending. Much appreciated.